So welcome folks uh, to Sunday Worship at Home and this is the 28th of February. can hardly believe that we're on the threshold of March and uh, certainly spring is in the air so um, there is that hope of uh, uh, restrictions being lifted as the uh, infection rate and hospitalizations go down and we pray that that will continue in the coming weeks and uh, that uh, maybe by Easter Sunday we'll be able to meet uh, in person here in the building but um, today we are online and uh, I'm just thinking about uh, um, where we're going today just to remind you of 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 3 to 6 where the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Corinth uh, tells them of what is of uh, prime importance of first importance and that is that Jesus died that he was buried and that he rose again and that he, he appeared um, to uh, various people, uh, the apostles, 500 people at one time, to James and then to Paul himself um, as, uh, as he describes himself the least of the apostles. And this is what the bedrock of our faith is built on, is the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to begin today by uh, singing two songs. And uh, one is the uh, song by Noel and Tricia Richards uh, with Gerald Coates uh, from oh, 25 years ago or so, He is Risen. And uh, then we're going to uh, uh, sing Worthy is the Lamb. And both are declaring uh, the resurrection and uh, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ as, uh, as central to our faith. So pray that you'll be blessed by these. So let's just open uh, with a word of prayer. Father, we just want to thank you for your goodness and your grace to us today. We thank you that, uh, for the, the, your death, Jesus. We thank you for your resurrection. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so enable us, Lord, uh, today to uh, lift up our voices, to lift up uh, our hands, to lift up uh, ourselves to you. And may we engage with you as we sit under the ministry of your word and as we praise the name of our Lord. So. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price that you paid. Amen. Thank you guys for leading us in these songs. So today we're going to continue looking at uh, Nehemiah. I've been looking at uh, this book over the last uh, few weeks and really feel that God has been ministering through it to us and uh, his grace and his uh, insights uh, through this particular book have been uh, um, very revealing and very encouraging. And uh, last week I know that when we're looking at Nehemiah 5, the feedback from uh, that particular preaching was uh, uh, very positive. So we're looking at Nehemiah chapter 6 today and uh, looking at uh, half the chapter. We're not going to look at the, the whole of it, but we're looking at uh, a situation where the opposition to uh, Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the walls and the gates, the finishing off of that uh, um, kicks off again. So let's begin. One thing that uh, the book of Nehemiah shows is that uh, life is a battle from start to finish. Right from the moment when Nehemiah sets his heart to obey God's command to rebuild the walls and the gates of uh, Jerusalem, he's faced difficulties of one kind or another. You know, back in the palace at Susa in chapter 1, and then we had the journey from Persia. And even before he got to Jerusalem, there were issues to deal with. And after he reached it, further challenges and opposition. You know, life is a struggle. Uh, there are always matters to battle through and issues to confront, and they never stop. But this shouldn't really surprise us as Christian believers. In Ephesians 6 verse 12, the Apostle Paul warns us, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. No man and woman, other human beings, are not really our problem. What we're up against are those invisible forces, the, the powers of this dark world, as Paul calls them. And these same enemies are found in the book of Nehemiah. They're behind all the opposition that he faces, the hostility, the disruption. And as uh, believers in the Most High God, we're met by an unseen enemy who hates law and order, who despises justice and peace, who wants to trap and intimidate, wreck and deceive, uh, um, destroy and murder, and an evil being, the, the devil, who is total against any work of God being built, whose satanic forces will never stop warring against the saints of God through their demonic interference and distraction. For whenever and wherever God's people seek to pray for and work towards God's rule and reign, being established here on earth, there are these hidden forces that seek to thwart and frustrate the plans and purposes of the kingdom of God. And that's what we're battling against. It's a never-ending battle. And so here in Nehemiah, as in many other places in the Bible, we learn the devil has two uh, main ways of working. Firstly, as Paul warns, uh, Peter rather warns us in 1 Peter 5 and 8, we are to stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a, a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You know, a lion is a very dangerous, fearsome uh, animal, of course, and uh, so strong that one bite from its jaws, which are, I'm reliably informed, over 40 times as powerful as the average human, can crush the thickest bone in the human body, the thigh bone. And one blow from its mighty paw can smash a human skull like an eggshell. So Peter rightly describes the devil as our great enemy who moves around in a frightening way, intimidating uh, through confrontation, threatening to strike at us with calamitous attacks and, uh, and, cr and to crush us with disastrous consequences. You know, that is the first way that our invisible adversary works against us, through fear. Secondly, the devil is also the master of uh, deception. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 tells us that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, meaning that he seeks to mislead and outwit us with what can be apparently very friendly and welcoming ways, which will fool the believer by temptations that he uses which are attractive, that are persuasive or uh, flattering. But by whatever uh, way the devil uses, whether that's fear or deception, his aim is to bring destruction and ruin to our lives. 
So we must be aware as believers in Christ. We're not to be ignorant of his schemes, as the Apostle Paul stresses in 2 Corinthians 2.11. And we need to be prepared to deal with these demonic tactics so that Satan might not outsmart us, he tells us. And Nehemiah in this chapter teaches us to be aware of how the devil operates and how we are to deal with him. So in chapter 6, following the earlier uh, series of threats and uh, verbal attacks by Nehemiah's opponents against those rebuilding the walls, Sanballat and his allies now reappear on the scene. So I'm going to read the first four verses of the chapter. Here we go. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, although up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great work and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? And four times they sent me the same message and each time I gave them the same answer. So Nehemiah's enemies couldn't stop the work of uh, building by threat and attack so they changed their tactics. They send him an invitation to come and meet them on the plain of Ono which is around 35 to 40 miles west of uh, Jerusalem. It's not far from where you would fly into Israel at the Tel Aviv uh, International Airport, the Ben Gurion Airport. And uh, Jerusalem, which is about 785 meters up, it's about two and a half thousand feet, you know, you would be going down from Jerusalem to the plain of Ono, which is only elevations about 40 meters, maybe 130 feet or so. So you're going downhill from Jerusalem to Ono, it's in the west, it's going towards the coast. But Nehemiah senses danger with this invitation. They were scheming to harm me, he says. He sees through their invitation in a, as a plot to trick him, uh, to get him to leave Jerusalem, a place uh, where he has armed support, as we found out in the previous chapter, to go to a place where who knows what might happen. He might be kidnapped, he might be murdered, he might be imprisoned. Nehemiah knew that these guys were up to no good, and he, so he firmly refuses. And he says, oh no, to their offer to meet up. He states, I'm carrying on a great project, I cannot go down. Why should the work stop? Well, I leave it and go down to you. And so here we have the governor of Jerusalem, Nehemiah. He's got this task to finish and he knows that if he travels, into hostile territory, he will not only be distracted from that, but he'll be potentially putting himself into a vulnerable position, totally unnecessarily. So he is discerning and he is determined. He is a man of conviction and purpose. But his enemies don't take oh no for answer. Four times, four times they try the same tactic and they're hoping, no doubt, that the repeated invitation will cause Nehemiah to eventually give in and that he will change his mind and respond positively. You know, their strategy is one of persistence. It's unrelenting. But Nehemiah refuses to be worn down by their insistent demand and to be manipulated by them. He stands firm and he won't be compromised. He remains true to his principles to honour God and follow his leading. I'm sure we too will have experienced at times persistent pressure to change our mind and go along with something that we know is wrong if we were to follow up on it. Because we live in a world where increasingly Bible-believing Christians with clear views and standards about matters like sexual behaviour and identity, marriage, abortion, euthanasia, are being invited, entreated and challenged to go down a road by those who are opposed to what we believe and who have their own agendas and who want to see further radical change in our society. More and more in recent years, the traditional biblical views that have served our country so well over centuries are being dismissed as bigoted and old-fashioned. 
Oh no, it's where the cry of the intolerant cancel culture brigade who seek to kidnap or hijack or shut down or silence those who hold such views. And the temptation for us is to just give in to the pressure or just to bury our heads and pretend it's not happening because there are these persistent efforts of political, media, peer group voices and the temptation is eventually we just say, okay, okay, you know, we'll come with you, we'll go down this road, you know, we'll accept your invitation, you know, you've worn us down, and for the sake of some kind of peace, we'll just compromise and join you. And what happens, we end up somewhere personally, or as a church, or as a society in a place that we shouldn't be going to. All too late, we realize we're in the land of Ono, a place where our enemies Kind of can trap us where they're in control, a place where our influence is neutered and we're no longer in a position to carry on or complete the task that God gave us to do in the first place. You know, there are places on our journey of faith that we are to avoid going, places where we're to exercise discernment, where we're to be determined and to be uncompromising because deep down in our spirit, we know if we go there, it will be a place of danger, of compromise, that will prevent us from being involved in the kingdom building purposes that God wants us to focus on. You know, sadly, Ono is the place some Christians end up in. And in plain words, the plain of Ono speaks of a land of regret and remorse, even spiritual death. You know, some Christians have gone there who have gone along with the invitation to step down, to go down from Jerusalem, as it were, to the plain of Ono and leave where God has called them, to head far away from where they should be and have been taken captive by people with a different agenda and an unseen enemy working in and through them. We need to be careful who we listen to and we need to measure it against who God is and his word. We need to be discerning as to what we give our time to do and where we go on the journey of life. Not only in society at large, but even amongst our friends and our family, because they themselves may simply reflect the attitudes and the wisdom of the world around about us. You know, what might sound like good advice or a good opportunity may, in God's sight, be totally wrong. And I've said this before, but the good can be the enemy of the best. And maybe somebody needs to hear that today. You know, we need to check everything by God's ways as revealed in the scriptures and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And Nehemiah, a man of prayer, he would not have received this invitation from Sanballat without taking it to God in prayer. And as we've seen earlier in this book, you know, that can be a prolonged time of intercession or it can be an arrow-like prayer that is just sent flying to heaven. And the answer comes immediately. We need to be discerning people like Nehemiah so that we don't blindly fall into the traps that the devil sets. You know, we're not to be, as the word tells us, ignorant of his schemes, especially when he comes masquerading as an angel of light. Many years ago, a missionary in China proved himself uh, very capable as a translator and a diplomat to the point that one of the top American com companies made every effort to hire him. They offered him an attractive job, they uh, offered him a big salary, but he turned them down. He told them that God had called him to China and uh, as a missionary and that was what he was going to do. He thought that would be the end of the matter, and, but instead they came back with a better offer and an increased salary. But he turned that down too. But again, they came back, just like uh, uh, Sanballat, they sent the message again. And in the, for this missionary, his salary was doubled again. It was much more than what he had been originally offered. And finally, what he said to them was, it's not your salary that's too little, it's the job that's too small. You know, Nehemiah has a great work to do. He's not going to stop doing it for anything less. There is a, a famous English Bible teacher by the name of F.B. Mayer who 
died uh, 1929, I think. He was a famous Baptist pastor and a prolific author. He was a contemporary of D.L. Moody, a friend of his as well. And uh, he wrote this in relation to Nehemiah and the call to serve God. This is what he said. O children of the great king, let us pray that we may know the grandeur of our position before him, the high calling with which we have been called, the vast responsibilities with which we are entrusted, the great work of cooperating with God in erecting the city of God. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, called to sit with Christ in the heavenlies, risen, ascended, crowned in him, sitting with Christ far above all principalities and power. He then goes on to say, how can we go down? down to the world that rejected him, down to the level of the first Adam from which at so great cost we have been raised, down to the quarry from which we are hewn and the hole of the pit whence we were dug out. No, it cannot be, says F.B. Mayer. And this captures something of the attitude that Nehemiah displays. Nothing is going to take him away from his single-minded devotion to honour God and to be fully involved in God's work. He is focused, he's determined, he's discerning, and he is convinced in his own heart, and he is convicted of what he has to do. And so you'd think that would be that, that the enemy would now leave him alone. Well, not a bit of it. You know, the enemy is far from finished here, and he brings up another plot, a plot to slander Nehemiah's name. So let's read verses 5 to 7. Then the fifth time, Sanballat sent his assistant to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, It's reported among the nations, and Geshem, remember the Arab, he says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. This is a provocation. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, Artaxerxes, in Persia. So come, let us meet together. You know, these guys don't give up. You've got to give them credit for that, at least. Failing to get Nehemiah to come down from Jerusalem, they try this tactic. And so an unsealed letter was virtually public property. Anyone could read it. It's equivalent today of someone posting uh, something on Facebook or, or Twitter. And it's some letter. It accuses Nehemiah of having dishonorable intentions. It attacks his integrity and his motives for rebuilding the walls of the city. They're very serious accusations. Now, as most of us will be aware, we've had explosive accusations being made over recent days that involve Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon and others in the Scottish political scene and also the uh, Crown Office. Accusations which could have incredibly far-reaching consequences for them, not only as individuals but for the future direction of this nation. You know, we need to pray, you know, if we are not already doing so for our nation. We need to pray for those who are in authority over us. That is what one of the instructions that Apostle Paul gives us. We are to pray for truth. We are to pray for righteousness and integrity for men and women of character to be in authority over us in this country. And there is a spiritual battle that is raging in this nation. And as the people of God, we should be praying. You know, not just now and then, but as God in his word says, continually. Pray for Scotland. I mentioned this in the email bulletin that I sent out on Friday, and I hope you've been able to read that. But Pray for Scotland have begun a 40-day prayer and fast based on the theme, Cry for Mercy, based on Habakkuk's prayer in Habakkuk 3. And in Wrath, Remember Mercy. It's calling us to go on our knees, to acknowledge and confess and repent of the sin of this nation. And it is a call that is gathered momentum that is uh, uh, being identified by other churches and ministers across this land and in other lands. The need to pray and to pray for Scotland 
and we need to wake up to the responsibility and the privilege that we have to bring ourselves before God's throne of grace just like Nehemiah did in chapter 1 where he interceded and prayed and sought God before he even went on uh, this uh, task that God had given him to do and for Nehemiah if Artaxerxes the king hears of this accusation it could result in Nehemiah being summoned back to Susa or to have he already be executed because rebellion and betrayal of any kind would be dealt with swiftly back in the 5th century BC. It's a letter that begins uh, the way many verbal attacks do. It's a report of what others have supposedly said. Things like, you know, everyone's talking about it. Well, who is everyone? It says in the, the scripture here, it's reported among the nations. You know, it's not, you know, th this news about Nehemiah, according to Sanballat and his uh, uh, henchmen, it's all over the place. You know, Geshem, Nehemiah's Arab opponent, we've met him before, he says it's true. So if he says it, then it must be true, isn't it? And sadly, there are all too many people looking uh, on who immediately say, well, that must be the case. They've already condemned the accused. They haven't looked into the facts. They haven't examined the evidence. You know, it's easy to leave the impression, well, there's no smoke without fire. You know, I just thought of people like Cliff Richard who have suffered because of media accusation. But let's remember that the devil is the ultimate accuser, as Revelation 12 verse 10 tells us. Jesus called him the father of lies in John 8, 44. And unfortunately, two and a half thousand years after Sanballat and Geshem's accusations, there are many who Satan manipulates and uses to spew out their vile and accusatory words. Uh, and there are all too many people who are ready to receive and to believe every word without checking it out. Yes, let's get to the, the root of issues and let's uh, see what the evidence is before we hang, draw and quarter people. Not that I'm advocating that we do that in a physical sense at all. In Nehemiah's case, to allege that he's seeking a result or a revolt rather against the might of the Persian Empire is complete nonsense. Because nothing that Nehemiah has said or done gives the impression that he is maneuvering to be installed as the royal ruler or that he's anyone who would manipulate the religious system to his own ends by paying false prophets to prophesy. It's ludicrous, but that's what Sanballat is saying. It's all lies intent on stirring up trouble so that Nehemiah is forced into this meeting on the plain of Ono. You know, we look back to the Second World War and before then, Joseph Goebbels, the Reich Minister of Propaganda in Nazi Germany uh, from 1933 to 45, he famously remarked, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will come to believe it. Nehemiah, however, doesn't get drawn into a defense of his actions. In verses 8 and 9, this is what he responds with. I sent, for, I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying, nothing like what you're saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed. I prayed, now strengthen my hands. So Nehemiah gives a simple denial. He doesn't waste his time protesting his innocence or dealing with the points one by one and demanding the letter be withdrawn. Once again, the deception and the intimidation of the unseen enemy behind it all is revealed. Because the enemy's tactic is to spread fear and to get the people to think, you know, Nehemiah all along has had hidden motives for rebuilding the wall. That all along he is really the one who has been deceiving the people and that the king of Persia uh, who sent him. So in circulating this letter, Sanballat and his cronies are hoping that the workers will lose heart, they will become discouraged, and they'll quit. But once again, um, Nehemiah's spiritual discernment shines through. And this man of prayer prays for God's strength to help him carry on. Raymond Brown, in his commentary on Nehemiah, and I've got it uh, here, and uh, I've shown it to you before. Bible speaks today, 
a former Baptist uh, uh, college principal, Spurgeon's College, and a pastor in his own right in different churches uh, uh, towards the end of the 20th century. And he wrote, it's not easy to handle unjust accusations. The problem is as old as time itself. And so damaging smears are painful, but we can learn something from them, he says. Firstly, we need to honestly examine our own hearts to see if there is any truth whatever in the accusation. We need to pray with the psalmist in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, know my heart, see if there is any offensive way in me. Secondly, he asks, you know, what should be our response to unkind and untruthful things said against us? He states, God's word forbids retaliation because it only multiplies the sin and we must not attempt to take any kind of revenge. And he points us to Romans 12, 17 to 21. We are to intercede for those who, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, falsely say all kinds of evil against us because of our allegiance to Christ. We're also to pray for ourselves, especially for patience, to absorb falsehoods either in silence, just as Jesus did in the face of his accusers before he went to the cross, or by knowing that a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger, as Proverbs 15, 1. You know, there's no point to losing the head with people who falsely accuse us. It's not going to do any good. It's actually a bad witness. And it's not the biblical way. It's not the way that uh, the Lord would have us respond. Thirdly, in these kinds of situations, he's, Brown says, we can always find God as our refuge, our judge and our shield, just as David found him in Psalm 7, when allegations were made against him by a Benjamite by the name, uh, named Cush. God alone, he says, can bring good out of evil. And as David states in verse 16 of Psalm 7, a slanderer's words and the trouble they cause recoils on them. Their violence comes down on their own heads. You know, these are sobering words for anyone who's tempted to lash out or falsely accuse, you know, whether that's in a private setting, whether that's in a church setting or in the public arena. Nehemiah found his strength in the fact that he knew this was the enemy's strategy and that through prayer and reflecting on God's word, he could continue to receive the grace, find mercy day by day. You know, his prayer reminds us of an earlier prayer in Isaiah chapter 35, 3 to 5, where strengthen the feeble hands, strengthen the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come he will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. This is the God who Nehemiah is depending on. This is the God who we are depending on. Let us therefore, as Raymond Brown concludes this section of chapter 6, let us be people who walk the way of holiness, who have found an answer to fearful hearts, to feeble hands, and to weak knees. And it is in the word of God, it is coming before our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So next week, I'm going to carry on with this chapter and we'll see uh, uh, further ways by which Nehemiah's enemies uh, intimidate and seek to undermine uh, him. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of Nehemiah. We thank you that he was a man of, who was determined, a man who had a call upon his life, that knew that he had a task to fulfill. But Lord, you give him discernment against the enemy's schemes. We know that the enemy seeks to uh, spread fear and that he seeks to deceive. And so, Lord, we pray that for each one of us, that we might know that discernment, that we might ask you for that discernment, Lord God, that you might give us wisdom to live our uh, lives in these days which are very challenging. And God, just as the, the opposition would seek to uh, uh, nullify our influence, we pray, God, that you give us the strength, and you give us the encouragement, you give us the words to say, the prayers to uh, commit. And Lord, we pray indeed that you would have mercy upon this nation. 
Lord, that you'd have mercy upon our government, that you would have mercy upon what is happening just now in terms of the, uh, what has been exposed for the media to broadcast with us. And so, God, we ask that you would raise up men and women of integrity in this nation to rule over us with justice and with compassion, who would seek to serve and be uh, people who would be accountable to those that they are serving. And Father, within the church of Jesus Christ, we pray that your spirit will strengthen us in the innermost part of our being. Lord God, that we would seek to be truthful, that we would seek to be, draw close to you. And Lord God, that we would have a heart for this nation and for the nations of the world. Lord, we pray your blessing upon us as a company of your people. Be with us, Lord. Fill us with your love, with your Holy Spirit. And God of grace, lead us on in these days. Protect and guard and guide. And may your glory be known in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to finish uh, our service today by a, with a song of praise, Hosanna by uh, Hillsong, and uh, the band will lead us in this uh, song. Um, Hosanna is an expression of praise and worship declaring uh, Jesus is the Saviour. And uh, w one of the verses has, Heal my heart and make it clean, open up my eyes to the things unseen. And it's covering aspects of what uh, we have shared today, um, accusations that we may have uh, had to deal with, and uh, that the Lord can heal us through his spirit and uh, to express our forgiveness for those who have uh, wronged us and said unkind things and uh, un uh, unhurtful things to us. Open up my eyes to the things and seeing that we have an, uh, an enemy who is uh, um, bent on our destruction and uh, let us remain close to the Lord and uh, may we depend on his mercy and his grace so be blessed as we uh, sing this song and then we'll come back and close just with uh, two three verses of scripture as a benediction <laughs>
let me read just from uh, Hebrews 4, verses 6, 14 through 16. Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need, today, this week, and forever. And we praise God for his word. We praise God for Jesus. We lift up our hosannas to him and we lift up our praises. So God be with you. Let the Holy Spirit, uh, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with and abide with you. And may the name of Jesus be on your lips as you give glory to God our Father. That's my prayer. Uh, that's my blessing upon you. And uh, we'll see some of you through the week. And we'll see some others uh, um, in person at a future date. So uh, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye for now.